Hello and good time zone, everybody. Welcome to Horde of Tales today for our very first session of Sixth Moon Saga, a Fabula Ultima actual play that we're starting today. And I am very happy to host here. Who am I? I am Marcus, also known as the individual, pronouns he, him. And I am glad to have this table of fantastic individuals to take us into the fantastic world that we have created together. But I will give each of them a chance to introduce themselves to us, just going around our virtual table that we gather. And I'm going to start in the top left corner, Angela. Hello there, fantastic and wonderful people. My name is Angela lemus I use she, her pronouns, and I'm going to be here with so much excitement for this game. I've been wanting to play and try out this system for so long, ever since I heard about it. And all I'll say is uh, you will be uh, seeing me here playing uh, Genevieve Vivi Olmos, who also uses she, her pronouns. That's me. Great. Moving a little bit further around the table, Nikki. Hello there. I'm Nick. Uh, he, they, and I'm also glad to be here. I have been looking forward to this game, but I have no experience with JRPG at all. So I will probably be just bastardizing all of the JRPG stereotypes as we fum as I fumble through this game. And I will be playing Lien, who is a non-binary plural they them because they are two different entities don't know what they are we'll find out <laughs> promising promising next up the never squid or nev hi everybody i'm nev i am uh, your friendly neighborhood eldritch squid person and uh i'm also extremely excited to be here with these wonderfully creative people uh, I will be playing, uh, Sable, uh, pronouns they, them, mine are uh, she, they, uh, Sable is a totally normal, awkward, small person who happens to have dark magic, but honestly, they're, they're fine. They're just awkward. <laughs> they're fine. Just awkward. That's right. Nothing to worry about. And last but certainly not least with us, Gabriel, hello. Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel. Uh, my pronouns are they, her, and I'll be playing in Luara. And uh, so excited to be here because I really, I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> I am very glad to see the excitement from everyone here. Thank you all for coming to this table. Uh, I don't, I just want to tell everyone who's tuning in today that before we got together at this table, uh, we had a great session zero with all of, with this entire group, because part of Fabula Ultima's charm to me is the fact that you come together and build the world together. And I have to say, I've been building worlds as a game master for more than half of my life, but sitting together at a table with all of these fantastic people and coming up with ideas was a fantastic way to kick this off and i'm so excited to share what all of these people together have come up with and to see what kind of adventures we're going to have in this in this game all right with the introductions out of the way what do all of you say about you know delving into it kicking it off and i think the best way to kick it off is to just start at the beginning. That's what first chapters of stories are, beginnings. But the world we find ourselves in is already an old one. We are on Thea, a beautiful world filled with magic and the powers of what's called aura. It has been a world of danger and beauty and of people who seek out new challenges and push themselves beyond limits. It is the homeworld of people who have set out towards the stars and have found homes on one of the five moons that surround Thea. It is a world 
that has a mysterious ship sailing through the skies from moon to moon. It is colorful and beautiful, but it is not without its tragedies. 10 years before the start of our adventures, the moonfall happened. The people who set out into the stars set themselves the goal to create a new moon, a moon that was beyond the reach of aura, this presence of magic that envelops many places in Thea and around the moons, a source of power, but also a source that can get problematic when technology is nearby. The people who set out to create this new moon, the Thule Project, seemed to be successful at first, but not long after the creation of this sixth moon, it was destroyed, torn apart, and where it was in the night sky, there is now only a red spot and the remains of that moon flying through our cosmos. Yet since that day, nothing has been truly the same, not on the moons and not on Thea. Magic has changed, and those in tune with Aura say that the frequency, the vibrations of it, seem off. Creatures act strangely, and never, be see never before seen monsters have been seen out in the wild. It is a dangerous time. But it's also a time to start the adventures of these individuals. As mentioned, we find ourselves on Thea. To be more precisely, we find ourselves in the Merklite Swamp, a swampy area in between a vast mountain range and a thick forest. Only a few narrow passages lead travelers safely through beyond pockets of water and past the sounds of buzzing insects, roaring animals in the distance, and always this little lingering mist that is everywhere, cloaking lights in the distance. Our adventurers, however, are currently not dealing with lights in the distance. We pan into the scene as there are sounds of discussion. We see a band of travelers together with gigantic beasts of burden. Think something akin to a, to a furry triceratops covered with, covered with luggage and great bundles of goods and just letting out a, slight, a low and slightly annoyed Mm, sound as it's anxious to move through the swamp, but it can't. Its owners, it's the, the merchants who own it, each of them dressed in beautiful, colorful gar garments, having torches with them to illuminate the kind of gloomy glow around them. They're in discussion with a party of, well, currently, actually, at this point, three of the four of you. There's one I will get to in a moment. We see three of our adventurers, Vivi, Sable, and, and Luara, who are in discussion with these merchants. And Luara, actually, you are the one who is kind of the cause for this discussion. Due to some misunderstanding or something, you have been, you and your companions have been in talks with these merchants who are convinced that you were trying to strike a bargain with them while you were under a completely different impression of what was going on. Would you describe to us what we see when we see Enluara talking with these merchants? Okay. Uh, so Enluara is this uh, medium height, very fussed up woman, a princess in her homeland and she both looks and talks the part. 
uh, she is absolutely incensed at what she thinks is the lack of etiquette from these uh, merchants. They don't seem to understand that uh, she is expecting to receive a uh, a gift, like a symbol, a symbolic gift for her presence, which is like the tradition in her planet, in her room. And then uh, she is trying to discuss, no, I, I, I don't mean to buy anything. I am not buying. According to the custom, you are supposed to deliver something that is symbolic of our relationship. It doesn't, it's, it, it's not even something valuable. What is, what is wrong? And as you say that, and you turn towards your companions, <laughs> we see that not standing too far from you, there are Sable and Vivi. Let's start with Sable. What what do we see as Enluara turns towards you and Vivi? Uh, well, Sable is uh, quite short, quite skinny, and wearing robes that are almost certainly too big. They're kind of swimming in them a little bit. Uh, their uh, robes are blue and purple with symbols down the front. They are uh, they have sort of shoulder length blonde hair uh, and an entirely blank expression on their face. They don't really understand what's happening. Uh, but as uh, her, uh, as their companions might know that uh, the intense look in their eyes, just means that they're listening intently it doesn't it it comes across as aggressive sometimes to people it's a little creepy because they really look at whoever they're listening to uh but they don't mean anything by it they're just trying to follow the conversation and looking to vivi and as that the camera moves over to uh, vivi which is not her full name but we might get to that, but what do we see as we see Vivi standing there as well? So, uh, in kind of contrast to Sable, Vivi is a bit on the taller side. She's closer to, I'd say, like six feet tall. Like, she's just a bit of a, a taller woman. Uh, she has, like, a shock of silver whitish hair that uh, go on one side is a bit shorter and on the other side she has pulled all the way down into like a long very practical braid like it would be probably simpler for her to just cut a good portion of the hair off but she's like no I, I refuse I have this hair it's pretty and I've put time into it I will make it work the rest of her outfit is extremely practical she has a short bow on her back, it looks like she has a pack that she's been rooting around in and like probably like looking in a way that seems slightly odd over at Sable's feet, making sure that like, did you bring boots to where you, I don't know if you brought boots. Oh God, I, I have to see if I have an extra set that's your size. And the rest of her outfit is something like uh, the equivalent of somewhere like hide armor but it's more of a traveling garb version of it like very tight very close very much designed to deal with a lot of wear and tear and she's probably a bit uh she's a bit of a bigger woman as well but like very much like hardened and very much someone who has the look of a person who's traveled a lot in the wilderness would you say of all these individuals that we've seen so far here that Vivi looks the most equipped for this kind of environment? Yes, yes. Most most clearly at home in this of the three of us and is just like, has a look of just a raised eyebrow looking in response to Inuara's just general... I was going to say behavior, but I, I think it's more accurate to say just everything. And with... Oh yeah, you would, <laughs> you would be there. <laughs> and as we circle around, Eluara, you are indeed in conversation with one of these merchants. You're standing right in front of this big burly merchant. He has this long, this long, puffy beard with strokes of white and gray in it, and actually these beautiful um, 
adore uh, uh, these beautiful decorations in his beard, like these beads and everything. And he has his he has his arms crossed in front of his chest, and he looks at you and listens at you. And he's like, "What? Well, what do you mean? Just give you stuff? That that's not how a transaction works. You give me something you want, and you were really looking at these pelts I'm selling." You, you see, you do not understand. I am not making a transaction. This is not how it works. Okay? And you can see that, like, Enloara is gesticulating, like, with her purple skinned hands, you know? She's mostly covered on a, on a, on like a, she's, she's mostly covered, like, because of the light. The light here mm -hmm. is a little too intense. Uh, and, um, uh, and uh, she is trying as most as she can to just like keep her cool because you know she doesn't want to uh she doesn't want to come off as the angry one although everyone has like it's obvious that she's the <laughs> angry one in the situation and uh, and uh she is like you 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 know what i am absolutely done talking with a lot of you it's just you know forget it i will but know that i will take offense in your crude behavior now and then she turns to the others let's shall we just continue on it, you see like this merchant figure is just at the same time surprised by how you deal with it but at the other time you just seem like throw his hands in the air and be like be my guest just Travel deeper into the Merc light if you want to. You uh, you might also want to keep an eye on uh, on that on that fourth member of yours. Where, where did that fourth member of yours go off to? And it, all of you noticed that you were there was a fourth person here with you, but during this entire conversation, this fourth person that you might have even been the most recent addition to your party seem to have wandered off. You can't see them anywhere right now. And we see our camera panning towards one of these mist banks in the distance and slowly a silhouette of the fourth member comes into view. Uh, Nikki, what does uh, Leanne look like? What do we see? Uh, uh, well, you see Leanne is Actually, not one individual, but two. One of them is a human who is about like 5'10 with these long, scraggly black hair that hangs down over his face. Features quite chiseled. Your, his skin looks coarse to the touch and sort of has some dirt like smeared around his eyes, giving him a very unkempt look. And his body shape is extremely lean and toned like you know a runner's physique but the most unusual features about him or rather the first thing that people will notice is his eyes black sclera and dark green irises like the color of leaves and his face is just permanently set into one expression and that is just blank stoicism and just looking out and with him curled up behind him is this large fox about the size of a horse with white and orange fur and two long fluffy tails though the vulpine features are a bit exaggerated the limbs are longer snout is also much more prominent with way too many sharp teeth inside its maw that it would be extremely creepy if this creature were to ever smile but you know, this fox is fairly temperamental. If any of you have ever read this manga called A Monster Wants to Eat Me, it looks like the fox spirit from that manga. But yes, that and is what you see. Amazing. Uh, you, you have been striking out a little bit on your own because not too long ago, you've met these three other people who have traveled through uh, the Hemlock Tangle where you had been uh, taking up your um, your residence for a while. And it happens that your goals, or it's more like your, your feelings about these individuals, something tells you that sticking with them for a while would be a good idea. 
as strange as it might seem. But what that feeling didn't tell you is that it's worth your time to stand around while they are arguing with a bunch of traveling merchants as you have noticed a trail, something that is untypical for these swamps. And I wonder how well you have tracked that trail. And I think it's time for the very first roll of our campaign to Ooh. see how that goes. So as an explanation for people, in Fabula Ultima, when you do a check, you're basically picking two of the attributes that your character has. And characters have four attributes. They have might, willpower, insight, and dexterity. And when you make a check for something, you take two of those. It can be the same, the same one two times as well. And you roll the dice associated with them and then add up the total. And that has to be a difficulty level. The higher the difficulty, the higher the, well, the, the higher you need to roll to get the total for that. For this roll, I would like you to roll insight and willpower. So you uh -huh. look at what die size you have in your insight, you look at what die size you have in your willpower, and you roll those two together and add them up together. Uh, my two lowest stats, 2d6. Okay. 2d6, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, I don't have any bonuses to add to them, right? No. Okay, uh, four. Four. Um, there is not... Uh, uh, <laughs> all right. So you have been trekking here, and the Merc-like swamps are hard territory to trek in. They are... Um, there's muddy grounds. There's water everywhere. So many sounds. And also, you've noticed that the scent here, the way the air smells, seems to have changed. But you look around at one point with your fox nearby, but you don't really know which direction you were heading in. You're trying to retrace your steps. You're not entirely sure from which direction you came. What do you do? Hmm. My fox just looks at me and you just go, not paying attention to surroundings again. Tut tut. And I, and I just, <sighs> and start looking around. Can I send my fox to pick up the trail? <laughs> Especially since your, your fox seems to be like currently mocking you a little bit, if I mm. read that correctly. Um, the fox looks at you, gives a little sneer, and starts to look around for the trail. While that is happening, the rest of the party, you have at this point noticed that Lien is gone, is not with you. What do you do? Um, if it's all right, maybe Sable is the first to notice. Uh, because they are the out of the three the the least involved with following the conversation uh so they sort of sidle up to vv and sort of tug on her sleeve um leon is not here i i noticed they're probably taking a look i trust them to be a little bit more aware of their surroundings. I'm sure they're not getting involved in anything too dangerous. Okay. Just it's like are are do you, are you okay? Are your shoes okay and everything? Get like what are you wearing, Sable, by the way? This is both an in and out of character question. Uh... He's asking this Sable. Uh, out of character, uh, they are wearing uh, robes, and underneath, presumably, you have already given them either some kind of hiking boots or walking shoes, because they definitely did not have those <laughs> yeah. before. I, I, I imagine it was probably up to this point, it's mostly like very sturdy, like worn out pair of shoes that are just like very broken in, and now it She's like fussing with her pack. She's like, do you, do you mind uh, if I take these off and I put on this next set? It, they're a lot easier to walk around in the swamp if you're wearing something like this. Okay. Okay. If you say I, so. I, well, I, I just wanted to ask. I didn't want to touch without permission. It's like 
bends down, takes off each shoe, and is just like very carefully putting the boots on. They're probably a size or two too big to you. Probably several sizes too Actually, big. Actually, yes. probably several because <laughs> she has very big feet and you are tiny. <laughs> yeah, Sable is like four and a half feet nothing she's oh they're tiny oh they are very small <laughs> i am like almost a foot and a half taller than you <laughs> the best and uh sable's eyes uh at first appear fairly normal but uh there is they have dark dark blue eyes with a line of bright purple just around the pupil and they watch you very carefully as you're like <laughs> taking off helping them with the boots which uh how do the merchants react to someone someone uh, to vivi putting on sable's boots instead of sable putting them on themselves the the merchants were slowly like packing up their furry triceratops creature at this point because they're wandering on they're they're done with enluara for the moment and um they um they're packing up but they they've been some of them have been looking over at you sable like trying to just gauge you trying to kind of just get a get a read if on it helps you. uh their insight and therefore charisma is the highest it can be at a d10 so wow <laughs> um that you you would have noticed that they're while they haven't in directly engaged with you they were too caught up in trying in discussions with Enluara for most of the part they have been like pretty surprised by your presence here like um especially in how stark the contrast is between how Vivi has this complete traveler's garb outfit and everything, and she seems to be traveling with a princess and you, who do not who do not seem to really fit into this environment at this point. But they have not been like directly engaging with you, though of course you could have the option of if you wanted to to interact with the um, with the merchants. I don't I don't think Sable would out of their own they don't really have a reason to so they they would not gotcha um the merchants are at one point done packing and you hear this furry triceratops I need to come up with a better name for these creatures um you hear it make another satisfied sound as they get going again and it starts lumbering forward on its massive uh legs um, they're slowly trudging off. Is there anything anyone else of you wants to do at this point? Uh, I I think Vivi like starts gets in Luara's attention. And Luara, how are you feeling? What? I am. I am fine. <laughs> You don't sound okay. fine. She says she sounds a little no. I am I am fine. I said I am fine. Thank you for your concern. I am well trained in behaving cordially and keeping my emotions about me. Now aren't we missing someone? We are. I'm sure Leon will be along shortly. Of the four of us, I think they are probably one of the most capable when it comes to navigating these kinds of places, and I trust that they are going to be okay, and that nothing of an ill bent will be following them. And Laura takes a deep breath, you know, as she now is actually trying to regulate. She looks around for a moment, um, and then she, you know... Turning back to the other two, she says, Why, but how long have they been away? I'm sure it's not been very long. I noticed I, I noticed when they were gone. I didn't notice right when they left. But I I think we can trust them to watch over themselves. Uh, I have a question, though. Uh, 
is it characteristic like we we haven't been traveling together for very long but is it characteristic of Leon to disappear like this and not show up because uh I don't know it feels like uh does it feel like a long time does it feel like do I have any clue is there anything that could tip us off that there might be something wrong I will like say that. Wrong question. <laughs> yeah, I feel like yes, Lian would probably extremely aloof with most of you. Like you know, marching in a group, you, the three of you are like in a line, and then they're just there <laughs> with your fog, <laughs> just a little bit away from the group. But only like I don't think Lian has ever, or rather, the human half have ever made eye contact with any of the others because the fox speaks for him. So the fox is the one who looks at all of you and is the one who speaks with a disturbingly human voice. Like, not even an undertone of growl to it. And also, I forgot to describe, uh, the fox has very human-like eyes, but with silver iris. So the, your first impression looking at them would be that their eyes are swapped. The fox should have the human eye and the human should have the fox eye but it's not, and it just looks extremely weird. But yeah, yeah, Lian occasionally just disappears off on their own because, you know, to hunt, to groom, or whatever it is that forest people do. But usually, well, the body, the human, doesn't say anything as usual. The fox will usually just mention something because the fox actually has decorum. But this time, there was none. This is odd. This is not characteristic. Um, I would say that Enloara, like, Enloara is a princess, but underneath all of that cover, you know, and all of that, like, the bright, beautiful, silver trim, the cloak that she wears, you know, to go unconspicuous among the crowd and just like every rich person walking trying to be inconspicuous around the crowd she stands out more uh <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know she looks around for another moment and below that underneath that she's a, she's a warrior she is like she is trained uh like she knows she she has mastery of like you know, she, she knows that fighting and going about, like, she's, she's not, like, new to going on an expedition or something. And then eventually she turns and says, this is, even if we know not, even if this is, there's nothing wrong about Leian, we are, we are stranded without them to guide us through this place. Are we not? I think Vivi has the look of like, what am I, chopped liver, just on her face in response to that statement. It's just like I, like looking, like just looks herself down and just kind of gestures to. It's like I, I did. This isn't a costume. I, I I know how to move through this kind of stuff. So what? I'm sure they'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and Luara hasn't bothered to pay too much attention to the other people yet. <laughs> Very much like, you know. Uh, seriously, like we, we got we got to work on Luara's personality a little bit, guys. Anyway, um, a little bit. <laughs> just, just, just a little nudge. Uh, and Luara is mm, that will do then. So, if Liam doesn't return soon, I am afraid we must depart without him. As you say that, Enluara, could I have from Enluara, Vivi, and Sable, could I have an insight plus insight check? So, twice your insight die. Six. I got a seven. As total? Seven? Total, yes. To the sixes. 
As you may have noticed, that she's not very insightful. That is a total of 11 for me. Total of 11 for it, Vivi. Uh, Insight is my highest, so I'm doubles on that. Would no Sable... joke. I rolled a double 10. <laughs> <gasps> and so both of your both of your dice showed a 10? Yep. <laughs> that <laughs> no means joke. You, also, you have the first critical of this game. My Whenever God. both of your dice show the same number and it's at least six, so two sixes, two sevens, two eight, blah, 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 then you have a critical success on your roll. And Yay. that means, congratulations, first of all, for rolling the first crit. Um, but also, as you, if you roll a critical, you also get what's called an opportunity on that and that means you can do something funky Ooh. and i'm just pulling up so an opportunity means that you can um th there's a bit of a list of things that you can do it's in the in the rule book it's on page uh 41 in the rule book but i think it's also on uh angela's very neat uh, summary that we have um for our rules and what you can basically do with an opportunity is that you can pick one of these opportunities and um get more on than what you would have just gotten on a regular success so maybe i will first tell you what you get because you rolled that well and um vivi also got a pretty good roll with a total of 11. So Vivi and Sable, both of you, while you're talking with Anne Luara, you, both of you hear in the distance from the direction in which the merchants have been trudging off already further away than you would expect them to be with such a hulking beast that they travel with, you hear suddenly a loud scream followed by a sloshing sound, a very wet sloshing sound. Sable, is there anything you want to spend your critical opportunity on? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. A different twist. Uh, I guess I need to look up in the rule book then. Yeah, there, page 41 in the rule book. Uh, the ones that are most relevant, uh, would be things like information, plot twist, uh, unmask, and bonding. It would probably be the ones that are like the best kind of options that seem to fit with uh, the scenario that's at hand. Sorry, everyone. Uh, no worries. No second. worries. We're, <laughs> exactly. A new. It's an entirely new system for all of us. Exactly. Yeah. And you're just kicking it off with the first crit in like the first hour of the game. That is so cool. Uh yeah. I'm I'm genuinely surprised myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using the dice I normally use for Vampire the Masquerade, so I guess I guess it's good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see. I, I guess the information. All right. Some useful detail that nobody else noticed. Nice. So the extra useful detail that you notice as well, after you turn your head in the direction of the sound, you see in the fog, in the distance, you swear, you see a figure like slowly just putting up a hood and vanishing into the fog. Uh, do I see anything about what they look like or just a, per a humanoid figure with a hood? A humanoid figure of average size pulling up a hood and vanishing into the fog
Um, Vivi, did you see that? Did you see that person? What person? Oh, they're gone now. There was someone there. See... There was somebody there? I didn't notice. Why would... Like someone who wasn't with the caravan? Didn't look like it. They just That's... pulled up their hood and turned around. I do not mean to be rude, but I believe that scream might be a more pressing matter. The person was the person uh, in the direction of the scream? Uh yes, in the direction of the scream, yes. Well, that's where the person was, so that um, is... we should probably go. Yes, we should. She like takes lead on moving forward with everyone. Yeah. And Luara is already like holding the handle of a weapon underneath the cloak. You can partially see her uh, clothes underneath. She wears a mixture of what seems to be some sort of royal gown and armor. All right. So the three of you head off into the direction of that scream and where Sable saw the mysterious hood hooded figure. Meanwhile, Leon, uh -huh. you had sent out Yuen to try and help you uh, uh, find your way back. Yes. And... You mentioned Ewan, Ewan talks, and Ewan has the human eyes, yes. while um, while Yao has the fox eyes, and Ewan seems to be more versed in the ways of humans than uh, Yao is. Yes. And all the while, while the fox is leading you, the fox has taken every chance of like pointing out any trail that is obvious to the fox, that you would have missed and leads you further towards that. And eventually, however, your ears perk up as you hear a scream in the distance. And oh. your fox also turns their head in that direction. All right. Hearing that, I am instantly without, almost like as if they are like in sync. Uh, the fox will lower her body down to allow the human half to j instantly jump onto it, clutching the fur, fur and instantly <laughs> zoom out. Suddenly, in in, like in, in perfect symbiosis, basically, there is no moment of, um, there's no moment of doubt. The two of you just instantly work together and head towards that direction. Mm. And I assume the fox Ewan is pretty fast. Yes. Right. And while you're on the back of Ewan, can you also give me an inside plus inside roll, please? Uh, 2d6 again. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, four. Four. All right. Um, you, you run on, on the back of Ewan, heading towards the sound where it comes from, and Almost out of nowhere, you see, out of the fog in front of you, you see Enluara standing there. And you and just last moment before the two of you would hit Enluara just stops. And you notice as you stop sliding a little bit in the mud, you also see the rest of your companions, Sable and Vivi, who were apparently going in the same direction as you. Hmm. Uh, you and the fox will say, we heard screams where... We we also heard the same thing. We're heading over there right now. I'm worried. Sable doesn't say heard... anything. They just point. <laughs> and Luar is mentioned... just like absolutely alert. You, you mentioned also Sable is wearing like clothing that's like three sizes too large uh, for her. Not necessarily for them, for three them. sizes, but definitely too big. So when they, uh, when they also and point they have somewhere... And uh, uh, I, there are definitely stitches at the bottom of the hem where Vivi has almost certainly hemmed up the robes uh, so they don't trip over themselves. They also have a staff that they are using to not 
a, a very clearly magical staff that they are using to not fall over as they try to follow everyone and lag behind quite clearly. I, I was just imagining how funny it looks when you're wearing, like, for example, a sweater that's too big for you and you point somewhere and the sleeve is just like dangling and everything. <laughs> Yep, there are, there are funny cloth physics happening. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be patched out next next patch will fix it. Yes. <laughs> Too much work for the animation. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is what you get when you release the game like you know before in like alpha. A... <laughs> Not even yeah. a beta in oh, alpha. alpha. <laughs> Crackers. Sleeves just as it clips with the finger, just flickering around. <laughs> Closing physics or not, the four of you um, continue on in the direction mm -hmm. of where that scream came from. And the closer you get to the location from where the scream should have been, you do at one point notice mm -hmm. that uh, there are tracks in the mud ahead of you. You recognize some of them as these heavy, deep tracks that the furry triceratops um, would have left behind. But you also see sites of that there must have been fighting here. You can see there are um, there, there there are tracks everywhere that show that there must have been a conflict here. And you look around, and at one point from ahead of you, you again you hear. You hear a, a scream followed by a low voice of like, got lost you. And you uh, you hear the sound of metal against metal and followed by just a very curious sounding, oh, interesting. We'll get back to you later. You just hear this. You don't see any figures. The mist is getting, the fog is getting denser and denser. What are you doing? Is there any way to, um, short of actual spells, there's no way like to dispel the mist or something, or, right? Or, so or... assuming assuming that the mist is you, it has a bit of a magical nature to it. I would, if you want to, and um, mm -hmm. you could give me an insight plus willpower role. Insight plus willpower, which you think is the six. Okay, let me double check. If you want to do it on the sheet, it's under stats at the bottom. Yeah, got it. I am afraid of the sheet. Uh... <laughs> okay. I got 12. Six and 12. six. Six. Bo oh, <laughs> so, but both of them showed six? Uh huh. So you have a critical success as well. This is a this is a critical success on your roll. Um, uh, so what's with the that page critical for success, the uh, extra options for me to look at? Forty one. Forty one. And what I can already tell you, as you're trying to gauge the nature of this, the way that the mist has gotten more dense and thicker so fast, there's definitely something magical going on here. Somebody is influencing the weather around here. Oh, okay. Wait, do I we... would say, I, you know, my, you see, y'all see my, like, um, y'all see in uh eyes, the irises are shaped like tiny little moons. Uh, you see her eyes, like, glint, like a glitter a little, like, glow a little, like, glittery, like, as she, like, with, you know, she says under her breath, like, magic. And then, uh, I would say that for my opportunity, can I choose it now already? Yeah, sure. I think I want to choose. I can't see the individuals, but I know there's others present, right? Mm hmm Okay, I would I want to choose Fopa. I would like oh. to choose someone who make a compromising statement uh chosen by the person who controls them. She's and, a creature uh, present on the scene, yeah. Yes. And I would like, um, I would like to be, uh, can, who seems to be the highest status, let's put it this way, between, among all the, those that Which, are here. 
What you mean by high status? The the, yeah, who, what you mean like who Are, seems to be in control here? Who in seems control to be of in, the situation, yeah. Right. Um, you heard towards the end, you heard this voice saying like, interesting, like this kind of more sec very secure voice saying that. That's, going by voice alone, again, you can't see anyone at this point. Mm -hmm. um, you would assume that person would be in control. Yes. That, that would be the case, yes. So I choose them. So you have, as you start realizing this is magic, you also hear, and the rest of you can also hear that, this is powered by the crit powered by Gabriel. Um, you, hear, uh, you hear this voice saying, and in the end, it does not really matter. We will have the wellspring destabilized before anyone will know it. And the, the moment what the wellspring the is destabilized. And the wells uh -huh. you, you do know that the wellsprings are these places in the world here on Thea that are kind of like coalesced magical places that are the key for settlements to stay safe. They can be warded with magic to keep monsters and other dangers out. And if anything would happen to a wellspring of a settlement, that would be extremely dangerous for its inhabitants. Yeah, I think the moment Lian hears that, uh, they will just charge forward and unsling the heavy spear they have on their back straight towards the voice. All right. Lian, you hear that. You're still on the back of, uh, of Yuan, right? Yeah, uh, I'm going to charge forward. Uh, how far is it away from me, this voice? I that's hard to tell because the mist is so dense, but you hear it. And if you charge, like it, like going only by how loud it is, mm -hmm. they can't be too far away from you. They would be in reach if you were to throw your spear. They would be in uh, reach of it. Okay. Uh, I'll say uh, Yuan, despite her extremely ferocious behavior, is a pacifist. She doesn't fight. So she would like just charge forward and then I... And then the human half will kick himself off of Yuan into the mist with the spear and charge in on his own. Uh, but Yuan will follow because they are never more than 10 feet apart from each other. Right. Yep. And I will go and stab if I can. Follow right. The voice. So just moments after you hear the voice saying that, all of you, you see Lian, this combination of, uh, of Yao and Yuan, dash off into that distance, into the thick mist. Leon, the two of you see, as you come through the mist, you can get a, a reading on the form stare. You see this gigantic form of, a, of this triceratops, this furry triceratops being lying on its side and standing next to it in a protective fashion, this man with the big fluffy beard has this large sword in his hand, but he seems to be wounded. And right in front of him is a figure in a perfectly white, what I can only describe as a very tight lab coat and a very high color that reaches over the, um, over the, um, the jaws. And covering up his top half of his face is this kind of, assembly of lenses of different ocular lenses that there's two currently in front of his eyes and another set of three over his forehead and the moment that the two of you come rushing towards there the head of this person in the white lab coat outfit turned towards you and these lenses they start spinning as if oh they're shifting their setup you can see that one of them seems to be sharpening its focus and you can even hear this sound as it's adjusting. You would say you were really trying to attack this person, right? You're wanting to try to get a hit in there. Is it, um, is it Yao the human that is trying to attack or is it you and the fox? Uh, the human. The human, okay. Um, and I assume you're going to use one of your weapons, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, my heavy spear. Your heavy spear. You can then, if you want to. And I think right. you do. 
You okay. can give me an attack with your happy spear, and I think that is a dex and might, if I see that correctly. Aha, uh -huh, which I have d10 in both. Whoa! <laughs> nice! Yes, uh, where basically me and the fox are basically opposite of each other. I have d10 on dex and might, and Yuan has d10 in the other two. <laughs> nice! Uh. <laughs> Oh, I rolled a 10. Total 10? Yeah, total 10. Total 10. You attack with your spear, and this person in the lab coat, after the lenses have done shifting, steps out of your way, both of, both of their hands on their back, completely unimpressed, just steps out of the way, looks at you. Oh, this is getting more fascinating. So many visitors in this swamp today. What is the rest of you doing in the meantime? Me too. I am like quick to follow. Throw myself right into danger. Why not? Sable, do you have, do you have a thought first? Um, Sable doesn't uh, doesn't really get emotional or urgent uh but they will they will follow not like fast because it becomes very quickly obvious that if they would try to run they would probably topple uh <laughs> even the quick walk they're doing looks kind of awkward and like they're they're they have to lean on their staff to not like sink into any or, or like trip over any any potholes in the road or anything. Um, it kind of looks like you know you know. Have you all seen Bambi, where yeah. Bambi's just learning how to walk? It kind of looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> that is adorable. Entire series is now protect Sable. <laughs> Does not matter. It's... Sable kills all of us at the end of it. Uh, up until that point, Sable must be protected. <laughs> We will all die for you. But if y'all want to know, uh, Eloara walks a little bit like that too because she's not used to the gravity. <laughs> uh, and she's um, all like and I, royal and I'm the queen and it's and like same thing. I did have a question. <laughs> uh, did Eloara mention that the mist was magical? Yes. I did say like kind of under the breath. But it, uh, I would say that's like uh, loud enough for anyone. Out of just out of character me. question, that's that's probably you can affect mist with a ritual, right? Oh, would take a bit. Yeah, absolutely would take a bit. Yeah, but I would definitely say so, going by my understanding of ritual so far. Because there's two different ways to use rituals, I think. One is out of combat, and then there's one that's in a conflict. Which I assume we're in right now. <laughs> it's probably there, at this point. Yes. Did, someone did just try to stab a person. Yeah, yeah. But basically, we are at the precipice of an actual conflict. Uh, would I know... Would this be elementalism or ritualism or what would if this it, be? If it would be like, if you're trying to see if you can influence the fog, that would be more like an elementalism because it's like an elemental part of nature that you're trying to influence. Okay. I can't, I can't cast elemental rituals, mm. so. Mm. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> not yet. So Sable's just going to, not as quickly as everyone else, but go in the direction of the the screaming the right. sounds of now fighting all right vivi um she pulls out the bow and she is not immediately going for something terrible it meaning in her mind like kill somebody i was like this this we could well, there was a step or two before this but uh, she is going to try and fire off a shot, and depending on if it succeeds, we'll see if I change it into something else. Right. Um, I'd say, well, how about how this goes? Let's go, uh, VV, and roll for an attack with your with your bow. Yes. And I think that is D 
Dex and Insight? Uh, I double checked on Shortbow. It's Dex Dex. Dex Dex. All right. Yeah. Let's go with the Dex Dex. That is a nine, unfortunately. It's a nine. The arrow goes flying towards an in the direction of this confrontation, you just slowly getting a little bit closer and seeing that there's multiple people there, but it doesn't seem to land. There's no hit at that point. But you do mm -hmm. see that as also Sable is moving closer to that direction, and I would assume that also Enluara and Vivi are slowly going into that direction as well. Uh, you would see that um, the duo of Leon is currently not too far away from indeed this figure in this white tight suited lab coat with this intricate set of lenses on their forehead and and their eyes and now also being aware of the rest of the party coming closer they still have their hands on their back and they look at all of you and say fascinating fascinating it must have been a very special day here in the swamps for that. I did not anticipate such an extraordinary crowd. I and... want to beat up this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then this person looks over to uh, Sable. And looking at Sable, you see that some of these lenses shift again over the right eye. A uh, red colored lens shifts over and there's like a click click sound. And then a the person cocks their head. Oh, that's one for the notebook. Mm. LS, there are uh, other priorities here. I have no time for this tomfoolery. And they reach into their lab coat. And you see they pull out just this, what looks like a little bit of crystal with a very dark purple glow to it. It's just a very small bit of it. And they fling it away from themselves. It lands on the ground in the muddy ground in between all of you. And slowly rising from the ground, first slowly, you see these vines coming out and then faster, rapidly, these vines and eventually this gigantic, almost pumpkin-like figure with dark glowing eyes and thorny vines stands there and the person in the lab coat just says this should keep all of you busy i have a very full calendar today and i am actually going to spend one of my ultima points because in Fabula Ultima, there are two mechanics that are named after the game. All of these player characters have Fabula points. When they created their characters, they got three of those. And they can use these Fabula points to do a lot of stuff, even going so far as altering the story to a certain degree. As the GM, I get Ultima points. And I get these points when I introduce a villain, which I have just done. And uh, that got me five, five Ultima points. And I have to be careful with these because um, I have to spend them wisely. And I can spend one of them to have a villain escape in the true classical fashion of the villain just getting away. But the good thing is, because I now spend an Ultima point, all of you are getting an extra experience point at the end of the session. So, uh, in some way, you want me to spend these. And uh, um, speaking of uh, fabula points, now might be the time to mention uh, we start with three and then we get one at the start of the session and we get one now because the villain made an entrance, right? Yes, correct. Do you get a fabula point when the villain makes an entrance? Whenever a player. Yeah, yeah, that's what it says when on the sheet. A villain ma makes an entrance during a scene, even as each. Yes, you all get one. And. Um, you only get a fabula point if at we, the start if we of have the session none. if you have no fabula points. So we should all have four right now, but you are correct, exactly. uh, Nev, yeah. that we do get one because the villain made an entrance. Exactly. You get you have four of those, each of you. Uh, but this villain with his high color, strange glasses is just vanishing in the in the in the fog, in the mist, 
as this gigantic, monstrous, evil glowing pumpkin plant creature is standing before you. We have this shot of the party in front of it. And then we have this screen transition over into combat as we enter our combat scene. And that means... <laughs> As I will also <laughs> change the background for that a little. It, 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 if we win, you have to have the eight-bit sprite thing of everyone does the like. <laughs> it's not even that one. It's it's just the little animation where they're like, it looks like they're like praising their hands up and down, and it's. Oh so yes, the, the yeah, I've seen gifs of that. Yeah, it's that one. <laughs> it's so cute. So, so happy. we are entering a conflict, and that means as we're entering a conflict, we have to check who is, which side is going first. Initiative in Fabula Ultima is basically first we decide which side actually has the initiative. And then after that, the side that gets initiative starts with the initiative. And then the other side gets a turn then you guys get a turn again and we just change orders as long as they are they are enemies and to start off with initiative this is going to be a group check what that means is that one of you is actually going to roll this initiative roll and the rest of you is going to support them in that uh -huh. so everyone who supports will have to make a an dexterity and inside check and when, they, when the total of that is 10 or more, the person who is actually rolling the initiative, which is also a dexterity and insight, gets a plus one on that roll for every one of, of the supporters who succeeded on the initiative check. So who of you would like to be the leader in this check? Uh, narratively speaking, me. narratively speaking, it feels to me like Leon should be the leader here because they kind of started all of this. And the rest of you will be supporting here. All right. So D10 and D6. Yes. And the rest of you can also roll a dexterity and insight. And if the total of that is 10 or more, Leon gets to add plus one for each of you who succeeds on that. I need them. I have been rolling shit since <laughs> this game started. Dex insight, you said, correct, Marcus? Yeah, dex insight. This is why I'm the forever GM. I roll, my roll sucks when I'm the player. Uh, <laughs> Three and one, I wrote so four. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I did not get a 10 or higher. Mm. I got a nine. Ooh. Ooh. Can I invoke a couple of points? Um, you can, because that is one of the ways that you can spend your fabula points. Um, and one of them is that you want to invoke one of your traits, right? Uh-huh. I'd like to re-roll one of my dice. And which trait would you invoke? And trait being your identity, your origin, um, and uh, your what was theme. What was this? Theme. theme. Which one of those would you want to invoke here and how does it apply to the situation? I think I'm gonna invoke belonging because mm -hmm. which is my theme. Because uh secretly uh and Laura just wants to be liked. And uh, and she actually cares about these people, you know? Right. And uh, yeah, so I'm just going to roll my D6. Feel free. You spend one fabula point. Yeah. And... I'm also keeping track of how many fabula yeah. points. Perfect. I'm keeping, ten... okay, I'm keeping track of how many fabula points you spend, all of you spend, because at the end of the session, you can also get more experience points if you've spent enough fabula points. That's also oh. how you can boost up your experience Ooh, so that was a 10 that was a 10 from Enluara. um sable had an had not a 10 if i'm correct yeah no <laughs> uh, i also had an eight so that would be an a eight. no for me so that would be a total of five then for the initiative yeah, yeah which is i assume not enough to match the the combatants initiative the, score i mean who of you could have been ready for a gigantic monster pumpkin coming out of the ground with tentacles flailing about? And this creature is now just towering over you and it has gotten the initiative. Um, 
it will then take its turn. And after it is done with the turn, one of you can take their turn. And, well, this is just one creature. It can't have multiple turns now, can it? Or can it? We're about to see. Um, we're starting off with this creature's turn. It is flailing around with its tentacles. And it's going to use one of these vines it has to try and hit um, Leon, specifically the human half, Yao. And for that, it is going to roll its dex and might. Oh, God. Um, that is... It's that. And... I have a total of 11. What is your defense? My defense is plus 11. So it just uh, hits. Just hits, indeed. There's just a hit as it does so. And as that vine slashes, slashes you, you actually take 13 points of damage from it as it just hits you in the face with it and has enough other vines attached to it to try to do it again at a later point. But it is the turn for the player character sides. Who wants to take the first turn here? Hmm. Can I do it since uh, it's right in front of me? <laughs> sure. Yep. After getting, I'm good with that. Getting after getting smacked by the vine, uh, the human half of Lian gets even more angry and is gonna raise up his spear and once more thrust it into this pumpkin creature. This the desecration of the natural world, as he as they've already <laughs> labeled this that scientist person and this creature. Oh my goodness, my dice flew everywhere. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, this uh, 10. I have not rolled higher than 10 this a entire 10. day. A 10. Well, I do have good news for you. 10 is the number we're looking for. Oh. So uh, what's the damage on that? Uh, what does HR mean again for damage? I uh, highest roll. Highest roll. So you, you take the highest die that you rolled on your attack okay. roll. And then right. you add the damage bonus to that. Okay, uh, six plus eight, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, plus, yeah. Uh, uh, so fourteen physical damage. Fourteen damage with your yeah, spear, it's... and you lunge <clears throat> in there, and you like it pierces through the pumpkin skin, whatever it is. You it pierces in there, and there's actually a mo another hole now coming, and there's more of that dark light glowing out of it as this pumpkin just cackles in response like, <laughs> it's not done with you yet. Oh boy. All right. Now, usually each creature only gets one turn, but this, this evil pumpkin is a champion creature. So it gets one additional turn and it has just been stabbed by a human there, but there's other people it can try to attack as well. And it is going to try and take a swing at Vivi, which I am going to roll. That is that and that. Oh, that's a total of four. I think that does not hit. No, I don't. That's... I don't. My armor is more for travel, where it's not meant to protect me. But that's definitely not enough to get me. And that just goes wide as it swipes around, and that also already ends its turn, which means one of you, who isn't Leon, can take a turn. I'm going to say like I go pick. last, because Sable is terrible at physical things. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go, I'd go say, on, Laura. I'd say, yeah, I'd say I go next, because I, like, charged yeah, second. That makes sense to me. Uh, um, and I would like to slap this thing silly, but uh, <laughs> how many tentacles does it have? Excellent question. I'd say it has seven. Seven. Oh, what a number. Um, I think I would like to... I'm sorry, because I forgot I had this ability. Retroactively, can I stand to defend uh, Leon? 
because I have this ability to guard someone. Like, your guard ability from your yes. guardian, right? Yes, I can protect with someone else. It's called protect. Uh, when another mm -hmm. creature is threatened by an attack, I may take their place. You may take their place. Any checks yes. that are part of the danger will be formed against you. You may declare the use of the skill before or after the checks have been made. If the danger already affected you, it affects you twice. Um, I would say, um, since we already also did the damage and everything, not for this one. Then let's move on. Uh, with but it. it's okay. good to keep this in mind that you can do this because this can really help people out in a pinch. So that's good yes. to know that we have that. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I am going to, I am going to, all right. So Eluara goes like full, you know, uh, Shira mode as like, she throws the cape away and draws her, uh, you know, weapon, which is like a mixture of, uh, it's, it, it's a, uh, uh, what you call it? A technomancy weapon and, uh, that it is a sword that is also a staff. Uh, I use I use I use the staff stats for right. Uh, it's just it's just aesthetics, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyways, uh, but basically it's yeah right. Uh, basically, she draws a two-handed sword. You know that looks like heavier than uh, you know a person should carry. But then again, it's magical stuff, and it glows everywhere. And she glows everywhere, and she looks like a magical girl. You know from your favorite anime <laughs> for a moment, and she's like going full. You know. Uh, Shira, she, she, you know, points this sword up and you can see that it has a black glowing blade and that she, I'm going to unleash a shadow strike. Onto shadow this strike? Yes. Ooh. So. Use yeah, an I'm action to perform a shadow strike, might. roll your current yeah. might die and lose an amount of hit points equal to the number rolled on your might die. Okay. Yeah. So, so basically, I do an attack and I get to do an extra attack, kind of. If I understand correctly. You may perform a free attack with a weapon you have equipped. Yeah. Okay. So uh, my regular attack with the staff, I think it's inside plus inside. If I'm correct. And uh, five and two. I got a seven. Is that enough? Um, a seven is unfortunately not enough to hit with your regular attack, but okay. if I understand it correctly, you can still use your shadow strike to roll your might die and see if uh -huh. you take damage from that. And if you then take damage, you can still take a free attack against the creature. So the attack you just rolled, it doesn't hit, but you can still use mm -hmm. your shadow strike to just roll your might die and see how much uh -huh. damage you take. Which is another Z8. Right. And that's a one, so nope. All right. Well, you do take that. That just means that you take one damage from it. Um, mm -hmm. But since you did take damage from it, if this didn't reduce your hit points to zero, you may perform a free attack with a weapon you have equipped. So, and you can now make that as an additional free attack. Try this again and then add one to the damage because you dealt to one damage to yourself. Yes. So that's. One plus six. That's another seven. Yay! Unfortunately, doesn't go. I, doesn't hit. I am. You know, I'm gonna spend another points. I'm gonna reroll that one because that's this is BS. Uh... <laughs> Spending another fabulous point. Gotcha. Yeah, and the first that I'm gonna use is uh, essentially warrior princess because, like, what do you mean I missed? <laughs> you know I mean? Right. <laughs> We're doing like, so well, really everybody. Mm. Okay, so a six and a six, that's a 12. That does hit. So that, yeah. then, then you can take the, what, what is the damage that you deal? That's your, your highest roll die plus the damage from your weapon plus one. Okay, so it's a six plus the damage of my weapon is, I have no way to use this thing. Uh, six, should say, is that it? Yeah, that's, it should say like HR plus something. Yeah, six. So that's another six plus one. That's a 13 total. 13. Such ominous numbers here as well. Seven, 13. Yes. Perfect. And 
basically that's just like uh, Eloara jumping and uh, trying to slash the thing and it dodges, but then the sword unleashes like a blast of dark energy that just goes running up, you know, as like she, ah, I missed and then and then she's like uh, tearing darkness into everywhere and there's like silver hair flowing everywhere. It's just like it, it's a show. It's it's like you know. Yes, Perf yes, it's perfect, fantastic. Yeah. That's some warrior princess action, L like a normal, yeah, like a normal person fighting would do, of course, right? Right, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> All right, that leaves still either Sable or Vivi with a turn after this impressive demonstration of sword skill. Uh, I think, uh, if it's all right with you, Sable, I'll take it. Yep, yep. And I think uh, what I'm going to do instead of trying to attack it directly is I'm just going to try and make sure it can't hit us as well. Uh, I'm going to tr use my action to try and hinder it. Hinder with, it? Yes. So uh, I can perform a check, difficulty level of 10 against an opponent. If I succeed, I inflict uh, one of four potential conditions on it. Mm. So in terms of... Uh, what you would like me to roll, Marcus, what would you like me to go for with this? Would it be dex insight, or would it still be the same weapon stats how, that my bow is using? How would Vivi try to hinder it? I think she'd probably be trying to use her bow to see if she could time a shot to where, like, the vines, like, if there's multiple of them flailing around, she's trying to wait for a time where, like, all of them kind of are collected together and just get an arrow shot that maybe doesn't deal damage, but it does like pierce through a couple of them so that right. my goal is to inflict weeks to lower its might die size so that it can't oh. hit us as effectively even better if you succeed in lowering the might die that will lower its defense as well no wait sorry that's dex that's dex sorry but uh might is indeed for the hitting but that's yeah. a good one i would say since you're still trying to do that with your bow you can do that with uh dexterity and insight the same role that uh your bow would use and we're okay. looking for 10 here. Looking for 10 here. So I'm going to try and do that. Uh, same one as my bow, you said? Yes, same as your bow. Okay. So let's go with that. No modifier. That is 15. Ooh, nice. You do indeed wait for that moment where you have multiple of these tentacles like close together. And then your arrow goes flying and just goes through a few of them and kind of pins them together. And all of you see that this pumpkin creature is now flailing about with a few of its tentacles stuck together with one of Vivi's expertly placed arrows. Yep. Basically, it now has the weak condition on it. It's a status effect that its might die size will drop by one. So it'll make that it harder for it to hit us. Absolutely. Is it? Does it say how long that lasts? Is there it does anything? not, but uh, I can double check in the book. I'm inclined to agree that uh, to think that on average it is just until start of next turn. I will double yeah. check that and let Sable take their turn. Perfect. Sable, what are you going to do? Um, I'm going to um, cast a spell because that's what they're good at. Um, Let's see. Uh, so they they have a magical staff, which is mm -hmm. entirely sleek onyx staff, as tall as they are because they're tiny. Uh, with at the top, there's like the 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 onyx is sort of weirdly shaped and carved to be almost eye shape, with a bunch of like gems or something making it almost look like stars. Uh, and Ooh. they raise the staff and uh, you know that feeling of reverb reverbing your chest when you're standing next to a big speaker? You, anyone standing close to them feels that as they uh, uh, raise the staff and cast Umbra. And I will Ooh. describe what it looks like if, if it does anything. <laughs> awesome first spell of this campaign which means for umbra since this is an offensive spell it still does to need to roll. hit yes so that is an insight and willpower if i'm not mistaken yes correct 
And that is a 14. Oh, and that is against its magical defense in this case. Um, and yeah, that hits. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the high roll was a 10, yes. so it takes 25 dark damage as, uh, the, there, this black sort of almost like paint splotchy textured energy beam just shoots out at this pumpkin thing with purple sparks all throughout it. And anyone standing close enough to see will see that uh, while they cast this spell, their eyes have turned entirely black. Wow. Okay. Love caster um, so much. How much? How much damage was that again? It's high roll plus fifteen, so that's ten plus fifteen. That's twenty-five dark damage. Holy moly. Um. So that display of magic, this little bit of cosmic power channeled through your staff and into this creature there's this loud cracking sound as parts of the pumpkin monster's shell are just torn apart one side is completely blasted off and where there was once pumpkin as no matter how big it was that side there is now filled with dark shadowy energy that curls out of it and in that darkness one green glowing eye starts to form as your pumpkiny enemy has entered crisis because you have blown it well past half of its hit points at this point and you see most of its tentacles are getting now charged with also this dark energy as it's still most of its tentacles pinned by the arrow at this point um but it sees that it's not dealing with its average adventurers at this point and looms well over you. And how that will change the battle in round two of this encounter and how our adventurers will make it through their first fight out here in the Merklight Swamps, we're going to see after we take our first break for today. So hang in there. We'll be back in about 10 minutes, so about um, 40 past the hour. Grab yourself a drink, um, check if your inventory still has all the Phoenix Downs you need, and um, we'll be back with you in a moment. So um, see you in a few. And we are back. Welcome back to the second half of our very first session of Sixth Moon Saga, a Fabula Ultima actual play here on Horde of Tales. In the first half, of our adventure, we have met our illustrious band of adventurers who are currently in the Merc-like swamps traveling and they have encountered a mysterious figure who apparently wants to do something to a wellspring, a magical place of harbor and sanctuary. Our heroes cannot allow that. However, the mysterious figure has escaped and left behind a monstrous pumpkin that just got attacked by swords and spears and blasted with powerful magic, but is still up. Parts of its pumpkin shell remaining, half of it pumpkin, the other half shadowy magic and arrow pinned tentacles right now. We are at the top of round two against this creature and the creature still has initiative. So it gets a first turn which is slightly complicated because Vivi, Angela, Angela's character, pinned an arrow through multiple of its tentacles and it's currently is, I think the condition is weakened at this point, which reduces the might die. I also checked because it's not limited to a specific skill that says it, it just has that apparently. So those tentacles are stuck in there, okay. <laughs> So that is the good, the good news. The bad thing is, the bad news is, is that before the break, I described how out of the parts of the pumpkin that Sable blasted away, these shadowy magic came forth that is enveloping some of the remaining tentacles and they start moving faster. So as it has entered its crisis, being at lower than half hit points, all of its attacks gain the multi two trait at this point, which means every time it makes an attack, it can make that attack against two 
targets. Mm. And it is go. However, it has a harder time doing those attacks because um, it's my die is uh, is reduced. Um, so let's see how that goes as we have some vines attacking first. Actually, if I read, I just double checked um, multi. I just have to perform a single accuracy check and compare it to the defense defense of every target. So I just make one attack roll and compare it to two targets. So this is against. And Luara and Vivi, as these vines come out against you. And I'm just going to quickly roll that. Do, 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 do. Where are my dice? There are my dice. Oh. Oh. Um, that is still a total of 13. What's your like defenses? That. It's going to get through. I only have defense of nine. I don't think I have a very high defense. Uh, I I didn't figure that out. It would have been if based you... off of your armor plus any additional bonuses that the armor gives you. It is typically you... determined also by dex. Yeah, if you don't have okay. armor, so it's my just your... my is 10. Yeah. I get a plus one from my armor, if I'm correct. So 11. Yeah. And Which it uh... still beats. It still beats, yeah. So 13. It still yep. beats, yeah. <sighs> Which means yeah, as of us, two uh, of these vines, as two of these vines, one. two of these vines lash out. Both of you take twelve points of physical damage from it as it just <laughs> slaps both of you in one go, and is still trying to wrangle the rest of its vines apart from the arrow that Vivi has shot there, but is not succeeding at that. One of you can take a turn now. Who of the player characters wants to take their first player character turn on round two? Hmm. Leon, if you want to go again first, either you or Enwara. All right, Just I will. Our... Yeah, go on. Actually, uh, out of curiosity, uh, what is the action economy like in this game? Is like, do we get one action? It's one action. Yeah, okay. one action per character. Does it cost an action to swap weapons? <laughs> I wouldn't say so. No. If you want to just try another okay. weapon, you can just do that. No, uh, you don't have to waste your turn swapping weapons. You're a cool JRPG protagonist. You just pull that out and you have your weapon ready. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm, in that case, I'm going to sling my heavy spear back onto my back and I'm going to reach out my hands, which for the most part is concealed inside the fur coat and reveals that it is it in it is the uh iron knuckles uh item from the inventory but i am reflavoring it to be claws like bone claws that i make out of like animal parts oh. and because and because i'm using this i get my frenzy ability from fury mm -hmm. so it so it does less damage naturally but higher chances of critting so oh so i'm going to just charge forward and it's gonna start punching away at this uh, while clawing away at it like just ah, you're like wolverine kind of thing let's go can i stop rolling so shit it's 10 again <laughs> well 10 is the and number so we're looking it. for so you do hit <laughs> all right okay uh, try rolling the dice in the this the digital sheet <laughs> I really should. Uh, so seven, <laughs> seven is the highest plus six. So thirteen uh, physical damage. Thirteen physical damage, just with your bone claws clawing into this pumpkin creature, chipping away more of it as it's violently lashing about. Hmm. It seems to be the more, especially at certain point, Lian or uh, Yao. There is one place there where you bring your claws in and a pretty large chunk of the creature comes off and just dissolves in these dark particles. Like mm. you, get an, you get the impression it's not going to hold on for much longer if you and your companions can keep this up. All right. You hear the fox just speak. It's almost down. Focus fire. And that's the end of my turn. And at that, this champion creature is taking its second turn it's allowed to take. And it's 
just got hit by Lian, uh, by, by Yao and uh, Yuan with this attack. And it's going to make another Vine attack against Lian and, and Luara. So I'm going to roll for that. This is one Come attack roll me. for. <laughs> That's not a good start. Oh. Oh, but it's still a total of 13. Yeah. Uh, that hits. <laughs> it does, and I think that also hits and Luara. Yeah. So that is for both of you, since that was a 10 on the D10 there, and that was my highest roll. That is 15 points of damage to both of you. To uh, <sighs> and and Luara, <laughs> as it just violently <laughs> slashes around with the vines. Okay. And what's um? How many? How many? What was the first attack? I might be in my uh... crisis. Crisis. Yeah. That was the first one was 13 points 13 of damage. I think that's 20, 28. I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Someone helped oh, me do the math, but I, if I, I am a 27 or this. less, oh, boy. if I am 27 or less, that's it. Then, then you're in crisis. That means if you have anything that happens once you go into crisis, that would okay. kick off. Yeah. I'll double check, but I don't. That also means that was this creature's second turn, and it goes back to you as the players. Who wants to take? Uh, the next I want turn? to. I actually want to take the moment to uh, 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 painful lesson. Uh, I lost hit points, so I can use the study action for uh -huh. free. You can use the and study action for free. Yes, and if I do, uh, I gain a bonus equal to the. Lowest die SL. I don't know. Uh, SL is skill level that you have in that skill, skill level. Probably okay. one. Yeah. Okay. So you get hit by this creature. You take the damage from it, and you're trying to extract information from it. Yes. Um, let me double check earlier. what the study action. What kind of role that is again? Uh, also, I get that much reduction. Oh my god! I have so many things. <laughs> It's almost it's almost like you just start playing a new character and you're just learning what cool stuff your character can do. It's kind of insight, right? insight, by the way, Marcus. Study is an insight insight. So yeah, according to the okay. reference sheet, it's insight it's insight, it's an open check. Open check. The higher an open check means in this case, the higher you roll, the more information I'm going to give you. Okay. So it's to the eight. And I got a nine. And you can add plus one from your uh, painful lesson skill, I think. I guess. Then, that makes then. it a 10. So that it's a it complete a... information uh, result, according to the Yes. Chart. So you, from that smack from that vine, as you're analyzing its fighting styles and the likes, you get the impression that this creature was once some kind of natural inhabitant of this swamp, some kind of native creature to this place, but has been warped by some kind of strange magic that you haven't really seen before. And you would understand, however, by the way these creatures in the kind of environments that these kind of creatures seem to exist, that they are vulnerable to ice and poison damage. And um, generally also are capable if they are so inclined to poison their enemies which this creature has not shown yet but it is vulnerable to ice and poison okay uh within uh, i mean it's almost done so i don't think this is particularly the but uh i, I suppose i have enough time for like one line one sentence I would say, Freeze like, it. since this is like basically, this is part of your react, kind of like a reaction that's still happening because you took the damage okay. and you get. Yeah. I would say you could like very quickly share yeah, this exactly. information with the rest of the party. Yes, uh, I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, like relay. I'll, I'll shout, uh, like, as I feel like the attack hit me and I feel like this light burn, you know, and uh, I feel, ah, it's poisonous. And uh, I jump at it to, uh, you know, split it in. Like, I, I want to make soup out of this. You want to make um, soup out of it? I want to make soup out of this. I'm going to make soup out of it. All right. Slice and dice. 
uh, yeah, so that's it. Basic frontal attack and uh, yeah, with all it got. All right. Make that attack with your weapon of choice. Yes. So it is my staff sword, my magical mm -hmm. sword. And um, if I am its willpower, it's to the eight. I got a six. That's a total of six? Yeah, total six. I think what? I am gonna... No, I'm gonna let the call at this point as I am trying to... I mean, I could use the Shadow Strike, right? Again. Yeah, you to like deal damage to yourself and make a free attack again if you want to. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. So you, so roll, you roll your Might Die. Uh, Might Die is the eight. Mm -hmm. And I'm just gonna roll... Okay, so my red die is might eight. two might. So you take two and, damage. Uh huh. And I got eight on four. That's a twelve. So that does hit this attack. Uh huh. And you can and, uh, add two plus... point. Sorry. Carry on, please. Yeah, you can add two points of damage then to the total that you roll. Okay. So your damage would be like your highest roll plus the damage from mm -hmm. your weapon plus the Ten plus total. two. Ten total. Ten total. Perfect. That attack goes in there with your Shadow Strike. Another hit against a creature that it did not appreciate. And it gets closer to the edge. Fantastic. That was Anduara's turn. Yeah. That still leaves Vivi and Sable. One of you two can still go. Go ahead. Okay. She is gonna... Like, okay... Okay, it's been a while since I haven't tested this out in the field in a bit. Hopefully this works. Hopefully this works. And you see she like pulls back like the sleeve of uh it's rather tight against her, and there is what looks to be an almost like techno arcane bangle with various runes uh, that goes on her wrist. And she you watch as her eyes, uh the like irises and the coloration go pure white. And she is going to try and make an attack with a short bow. And if this hits, uh, hopefully something fun is going to happen. But I'm going to try and land this first. All right. Let's see what happens. So let's see with that short bow. Fortunately, that is a seven. But uh, I'm going to spend a fabula point to invoke a trait to try and make this work. I think I'm going to use her elusive arcane inventor trait. She's like, this is the first time. Please make this work. Please make this work. And she's going to try let's... and do it again. Let's see how that goes. Fingers crossed oh, indeed. Oh, please. Please, I would like to look cool in front of my friends. <laughs> nope. Same roll. Same Doesn't roll. Work. Mm, so you, the arrow, fire it, and it goes wide. Are we allowed to spend a fabula points for others? Unfortunately, no. You can only spend them for yourself. No, it's only after performing a check. And yeah. I think it's the way it's worded. I would put it as me being the one to put the check to do the check. Exactly. Yeah. So that attack goes wide. The arrow goes wide. Um, and that leaves up with Sable as final actor in this round. Uh, well, it worked really well the last time, so I'm going to cast Umbra again. All right. Because uh, uh, I, can't, I can't really get up close to it, because then I will die. <laughs> oh, no, it's not, it's, it's, it's not like it's dealing damage or anything to people here. It's... Uh... <laughs> Literally, that one is... of its max hit would be half oh. of Sable's health. That is uh, an 11. An 11. Mm, yeah, that hits. That still hits. Yeah, 11. This is against magical what? defense. So, yeah. What it is its magical defense, actually? It's it's an 8. Oh, so... okay. Uh, so, the high roll was a 5 plus 15. Mm -hmm. So, that's another 20 dark damage. How do you want to do this? Ooh. Okay, so um, Sable 
sort of awkwardly hanging at the back, humming with dark energy that all of you can feel sort of reverbing in your chest. Uh, and slightly concerned about how much their friends have gotten hit. Uh, they raise their staff for the final time and just, like, meet the pumpkin's eyes just with an intense stare as their eyes turn black. And the the beam of energy just hits it square between the eyes and it explodes into ash. Nothing but ash remains of the pumpkin. The arrow that was stuck between some of the tentacles from Vivi clatters to the ground. And for a moment, there's just this sound of ashes blowing in the wind. As the creature is no more, the white lab coat wearing individual is gone from sight, but they're still nearby to you now that the mist, which Enluara correctly assessed as have it being magical in nature, is slowly becoming less thick and you can see more of the swamp around you. All of you can also see the lying on its side and an exhausted look, this furry triceratops creature and the bearded merchant next to it still holding up his weapon, looking at all of you, but realizing once you've felt the creature, he slowly lowers his weapon. Whoa, that was, that was impressive. Is this merchant uh, hurt? Uh, yes, there's like, he's clutching a wound on his side. All right, so this is, Lian is gonna turn towards them, sees both of them injured. Is gonna wait. Uh, I can use my inventory point to like pull potions out, right? If I understand the mechanic correctly. Exactly. You basically spend inventory points for certain items that you can then pull out of your inventory. Okay, so I will pull out some poultices, you know, natural made from the wilds, and then I'm gonna walk towards it. And it, the merchant looks like he's like ready. Oh, thank you. I walk past him and goes to the furry triceratop and start healing. <laughs> Yeah, he's actually, he's reaching out and he's like, oh, what? And you walk up to the Triceratops, who's like already, the moment you start putting on these salves and lotions, you can hear there's a very thankful, low sound coming from the creature as you're taking care of its wounds. Yeah. And uh, Lian will also make the same sound because I have feral speech from Chimera, so I can talk to animals. And so you I'm would just... actually understand to you and only to you, Lian, you hear this creature saying in this deep voice, Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. It's not that deep. <laughs> I... <laughs> back. The only time Leanne will ever speak is to other animals. <laughs> Meanwhile, That's Vivi's it. just like sighing and I'm just sorry. like goes over and, and like grabs a po <laughs> like grabs grabs a remedy out of her bag and she's like offering it to the Poor man who's clutching his wound right next to us. <laughs> <sighs> Takes it. Oh, thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Um, I didn't think we would, and chucks the potion, didn't think we would meet as quick again. And he he also briefly turns to Enluara. Oh, I must have underestimated the lot of you a lot. You really know how to deal with these like, I don't even know what that was. Uh, and Luarda is like, uh, you know, she... So the guy in... The, the mystery individual is still nearby, right? No, has vanished, has disappeared ah, before. I misunderstood. When... Okay, I misunderstood. And Luarda, you know, she stumbles a single step as she's like grimaces, but then she, you know, poises herself up again. It was nothing. We did nothing but what one must have, what must be done. I am glad that you were well. Oh, fortunately, the rest of my caravan, I, I hope they got away as well. This, this figure just appeared and they were, they, they were, they had more of these creatures that you just fought and they, most of us, we fled further into the mist and I tried to stop this person, but 
just dodged all of my attacks and then just kept mumbling about things like I'm in the way of this grand experiment and the likes. I think he also mentioned something about a wellspring. Must be some sort of crazed uh, technician or scientist. We have some of those, or we had some of those in bloom. But, uh, well, we try to not let this kind of evil take root. You know what I mean? uh, uh, the fox will say, their outfit is distinct. Do we know where it came from? The merchant who looks at you goes, oh, I have to say, I mean, if the princess over here mentions that there is people like that on her moon, I haven't seen anyone dressed like that in these parts ever. And I've been traveling this trade route up and down between Gulport and uh, and Fork. Uh, well, I've been traveling it a lot. I forgot the name of the place um, between uh, uh, Fork Bridge. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, uh, I've never seen figures like that. Nailed it. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, the, the fox will turn to it and Luara then and go, do you recognize them then? I, I don't know. So, and Luara takes a moment of thoughts. Uh, is there anything that I can uh, do? Can I think about it? Can I uh, try to remember? Is it... Well... The figure, like the outfit that the figure wore, was indeed not entirely unlike what the scientists and researchers on your home moon would be wearing. It's a little bit different mm -hmm. in style, especially that high color and everything. But what mm -hmm. was absolutely different was that device on on mm -hmm. their on their head and on their eyes. You have not seen that before. But mm -hmm. going by the rest of their outfit very much in the same vein as the scientists on your moon. Mm. Mm. Those technomancers. See, this is why I do not trust technomancers. We not must that. do something. We must, we must find out what is going on, but we also must make sure that our friend here is not left in the middle of nowhere to travel without assistance. Should probably get him to settle down as quickly as possible. Aye, aye. I mean, I wouldn't be. I, I would be very much inclined seeing your skill with these patching creatures like this. If um, if you wouldn't mind to maybe accompany me and the rest of the caravan once I find the rest of my caravan. Now that the fog is slowly lifting. Um, we're actually heading up to Fork Bridge. You know, there's a. It's one of there's a wellspring there. We can probably stay safe there for a while, and um, well, see where we go from there. To settle then, and then Elnora turns to the others, like waiting for approval. Sable. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sable with the same intense look on their face that the merchant is now realizing is their default. <laughs> expression turns to Vivi and goes he said I was one for the notebooks what does that mean uh, nothing good I would say it means you're special the fox says looking at you with the with her silver eyes I don't know about that I think we're all special hmm <laughs> Press X to doubt appears on the screen. Nah, I'm... <laughs> I am quite sure this symbol is somewhat out of the ordinary. Hmm. We're probably not going to figure anything out just standing out here, though. Let's get moving. Don't want to be traveling through all of this in the middle of the of the dark. All right. Sable turns to the the merchant and with like uh again that intense serious face in a quiet voice can i write the whatever this is called 
the same, merchant looks down at you first, like a little bit surprised and then smiles. You need some help getting up there? Um, I would prefer if Vivi did that. No, be my guest. She's a, she's a gentle girl. And he just gently pats the side of the furry triceratops. All right. Um, come here, Sable. And then, like, just very... Outside, in contrast to everyone else in the party with Sable, she has the most whatever possible she can muster. Like, the most like tender of approaches whenever it comes to like handling sable on any in any capacity and you can tell her touch is very somewhere between tentative and just very soft like just trying to help them up to the spot it's probably a moment where you have to step on my hand and it's it just takes a minute and yeah. probably accidentally kick you in the face or something and but <laughs> but end up on the thing Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I, uh, this is nice. Care about you too, Sable. Care about you too. Just taking that in stride. It's like, I've missed my shots today in so many different ways. <laughs> this seems about, about par for the course. While you're helping Sable up there, uh, Vivi, um, you mentioned earlier in the encounter with the creature that Vivi was doing something with a bracelet. Mm -hmm. um, so I assume there is some kind of bracelet contraption around one of her wrists. Yeah, it, it basically it's it, it's set up with a variety of different runes to that are attuned to different elements. Uh, they're my way of making use of the infusions from the Tinkerer right. uh, class. And so depending on what she channels, she pulls from her own body's aether to actually activate the rune, and then she fires it out once it lands successfully. Had it landed, it would have been a nice frost bolt. Exactly. So I would say, I, I assume that there's like, for example, there's one crystal that's associated to ice on this kind of bracelet. Mm -hmm. And once after you gave Sable a lift up to the big dinosaur species, we need a name for it. That is not a great pun that Nikki shared earlier in a Zoom <laughs> chat. Um, we, um, you look at your, you look at your bracelet, and you notice that the crystal on there for your ice infusion, it it flickers, like there is like a bad connection, like it's not properly socketed or something it's just this flicker in it and as you look down your hand you also see not far away from you at the place where sable just completely demolished that creature there is still one thing that remains just a tiny bit of this dark shard that the white coated figure pulled out to summon this creature She is going to very gingerly, like, put on, like, a very thick set of gloves she keeps in her bag. It's going to gingerly try and get close to that and see if there's a way to pick it up. You pull on gloves. You get closer there. And, I mean, you are a... You are a very well-educated person, I assume. You have... You, know, you have knowledge. You have studied things and you carefully approach it. And the closer you get, there's something interesting that you notice. The closer you get to that little bit of dark crystal, the more of your elemental gems on your bracelet start to flicker as well, as if there's just some static interfering with them. Hmm. I think she... She's probably like worked with like filing down like bits of crystal to get them to work for the rune enchantments and such. Mm -hmm. She probably has like a small like little pair of almost like it it it's just a steampunk version of like a set of like tweezers that she just like goes and she 
grabs it and she's like, hmm. Whatever you are, you're basically a void for the rest of this magic. I feel like I could use this. You are going to be something very special very soon. He like holds out a small bag that normally has a bunch of other components she keeps, but she and and it it, it to anyone who doesn't know the kind of stuff that she does, it just looks like random bits of junk. Like it's it's like s the equivalent of what fantasy cellophane would be. It's like bits of dirt. There's like very there's like a tiny little vial of like dirty water in there. There's a matchstick in there for some reason. She just like. You and I are going to be friends. Just sticks it in her back. Yuen watches all of this silently, taking it in. I have so much mistrust for this person. <laughs> for me? <laughs> I, I, yes. <laughs> Like, you can see that Enluar is looking with a certain gaze of wordiness, you know? Uh, I mean, like, she doesn't trust uh, technomancers <laughs> of any sort, because that looks like you're talking, you're bubbling, like, technomancy gibberish to her, like, you know, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, no, 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 no. It, it, it basically, it's right, or her inventions are kind of on the border of, like, technology and magic. Technomancy is, like, the closest, like, word we would probably have for it. But she probably does notice you looking. She's, like, she, like, pulls out the tweezers again. She's, like, ooh, scary. It's technology. Why stop that? You should it's not play with such things. It's not going to hurt you. It is a tool. Hmm. She's just like, you know. <laughs> you have a sword, right? You use a sword as a tool, right? I don't automatically think you're yes, a terrible yes, person because yes, you use a sword. It, it is it is different. Like, and then she shows it, and it's like this is a contained shard of a magical expression, and it is controllable. And I understand exactly what is going on here. But that, that I do not understand. So what you're saying I is you're afraid of it. something you don't understand. Got it. And you, yes, you could yes, take the time course. to understand it. You could ask me to understand, help you understand this. Well, I didn't have the time to ask yet. <laughs> um, Le Leon, um, <laughs> Yao is at the front of the, uh, of the beast, of the beast of burden there. And uh, you hear it say to you as you can speak animal uh, that you have mm -hmm. the feral speech like oh it's taking them so long i want to continue <laughs> i don't know human stuff as, as the creature rumbles underneath them uh sable just pats pats it on whatever part they can reach <laughs> and Almost there's and a set their their expression towards Vivi hasn't really changed. Their eyebrows have gone up just slightly in an expression that could be curiosity. The as you as you pet the creature, you uh, Sable, you're rewarded with a very satisfied rumble from it, and uh, Yao would understand this as like, oh, oh yes, that's the good spot. I like that. <laughs> this thing is adorable. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and the merchant who's like sure that his wounds have been patched up by the potions that have been provided he turns to all of you I mean this is like a very cozy place to stay but um, I think we might want to be looking for the rest of my caravan and then heading further towards Fort Bridge yes and with that all of you gather and over the coming hours, 
uh, we have a montage of all of you finding whatever kind of scattered remains of the caravans. Fortunately, m all of them have been able to flee from whatever other monstrosities this white-coated person had unleashed earlier. And they all report that um, even though they were, they clearly saw and heard many of these monstrosities, all of their sounds and sightings of them has have vanished, kind of matching with around the time that you destroyed this pumpkin creature that you fought. And they slowly come all back together in the caravan. Some of them take some of the um, extra lug luggage on their back. Um, it's a very in grand total, there's about half a dozen dozen people in this merchant uh, in this uh, merchant's caravan. And once they hear from what turns out to be their boss, um, how you all of you help dispatching that monster, they quickly warm up to you. They make up conversation. They want to get to know you. They're curious about all of you. They want to hear your stories, and um, they are also very happy to have extra people here to help them travel through the swamp after this kind of encounter. And we do see you as the party slowly traveling further northwards towards this earlier mentioned town of Forkbridge. However, there is this moment where the screen fades out to black and then we see at the bottom, there's just this text, meanwhile, elsewhere. And I'm going to do something that this game explicitly calls out, which is called a villain scene, um, where you are basically getting a cutscene from a villain. And I would just change the music for that a little. It is like high graphic renders. <laughs> so, so, suddenly all of our budget went into just yeah. these cutscenes. The combat was great. Like the main game is like decently animated, but suddenly the cutscene quality jumps yeah. substantially. <laughs> now in more than 32 polygons, we see um we see we see the camera panning over a part of the Merklight swamps. Deeper still in an area surrounded by this dark and thick fog. Stepping out of the fog is the white-coated figure. The lens ocular structure item it has over its eyes and forehead pulled down, high-tailed, co high cold up over the lower half of its face. And you... This figure pulls out a device out of its coat, something that looks like a cross between some kind of clock and uh, some kind of pressure meter, very complicated device with all kinds of gauges on it, all of them moving. They're just standing out here and then they say to themselves, fascinating, put the device away. And then they start to shift around the dirt beneath them a bit, take some of the dirt and the sand in their hands, in their perfect white gloved hands. And the sand starts filtering through the fingers, leaving not a single stain on the white of the gloves. Mm -hmm. The lenses shift, click, focus, And then from out of focus, outside of the shot, we see there's a voice. Are you having fun, brother? The camera pans over the shoulder and sitting on a rock there is another white coated figure. But this one has very tall, limb, long limbs, arms, long in proportion to the rest of the body and has a white hood coming out of the white lab coat. The face is not visible. You can only see the glint of glass from underneath the hood. The white coated figure with the sand in hand sighs and says, are we not allowed to enjoy ourselves a little on our mission here? The long limbed white figure says, there was work to be done. The high rock is still waiting. Do you have updates about the wellspring? 
It is required for calibration. Figure size again. Fork bridge will not be a challenge, brother. Put some trust in me for once. The long limbed figure snickers. <laughs> trust in you. There's a reason the High Rock demoted you. You know what you did. You know how, and the figure's not able to end the sentence. The white coated figure that you met before turns towards them and fires a bolt of dark energy mm. at the other white coated figure. A loud blast, the rock splits, there's dust everywhere. And once the dust settles, we don't see the other white coated figure. But then the camera spins and that figure is standing behind them, upright with these long arms. What I was trying to say, brother, don't disappoint the High Rock. And then that figure wanders off. The other white, white cloaked figure standing there, reaching once again inside their pockets to reach out for this strange device they have, gauges moving. And then at one point, some of these gauges glow brightly. There's a ping, ping. No. The figure says, no more disappointments. And the scene fades out. As we cut back to a party, you are accompanying this group of merchants towards Forkbridge. It's going to be a journey of a few days to get there. Is there anything that you as party members now still traveling through these swamps. Is there anything that you would like to do or discuss during these few days of travel with each other? I'm not sure about uh, discussion. Oh. Go ahead, uh, Liam. Oh, uh, I was just going to say, not sure about discussions yet, depending on what the others say, but just throughout the this travel with the merchants, anytime someone tries to make conversation with Yao, the human half, is just met with a or just a glare that just makes them walk away. But somehow the the fox that this extremely horrifying looking, intimidating fox is extremely chatty with the merchants and just talk with them a lot and just trade gossips. The merchants are initially have to get used to the idea that the fox is doing the talking here. Um, but after a while, they're totally in for it. They they love to talk to this fox creature, learn more about where they come from, um, and totally accept him as part of the uh, or accept her as part of the uh, of the uh, caravan. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you know, in Lorda keeps an eye out for uh, the rest of the party. Like, uh, you know, trying to... Trying to figure out, like, this... Like, uh, uh, um, she hasn't been on main planet for long, and she's, like, picking, like, customs and stuff. And uh, although she is, like... Uh, although she's, like, uh, very set in her ways in a few things, she like uh, I would say that unless unless uh, Vivi would say otherwise, otherwise, like uh, Vivi sometimes catches her like you know spying like on the side of the wild what she's doing like curiously, you know, and uh, whenever she is like doing anything that is interesting or out of the ordinary, and then but anytime Vivi catches her, she just pretends she's not or you know like. <laughs> I think um, if it's at least a few days travel, um, I'm going to invoke a thing that's unique to my class, which is uh, projects for a tinkerer because of that little shadow crystal that we have. Uh, we'll, f we'll probably figure out more of the larger details like past right. game, but uh, after the session, but I think she is looking, she's been looking at the shadow, like, because it's like a, almost like a crystal you said that was that was right. left behind, correct? Exactly. I think she's looking at that. She's like, 
Hmm. I wonder if this can be used for nullification, or like a localized aura effect. And she is, I'm going to propose to Marcus, our fantastic GM, who is benevolent and kind and will let me probably get away with some bullshit. <laughs> um, I was thinking to lean into like JRPG stuff. I want to create essentially a silence arrow. I want to try and create essentially from the crystal, either notch it into the quiver or create an arrow specifically fine tuned to actually, uh, I want to try and make the effect as specific and like narrow as I can to essentially just be, uh, let's say in the context of we encounter a creature that does use magic, mm -hmm. that this will prevent them from being able to cast any spells for, let's say, around like localized effect but right but i have to uh, it has to, it works the same way that the infusions work that it's effectively like another form of infusion exactly and that that's kind of what i'm thinking she's just looking at it and like pulling out a lot of other bangles that she has like i kind of imagine it's like they have little compartments inside of them that house the crystals themselves and she's just looking for one that has the right size and shape for it. She's like entirely pulled out. There's just a mess of these different, it just looks like she's hawking jewelry probably at some point. So she's working on this. I would imagine like at every kind of break that the caravan takes from the journey, Vivi is taking a chance to continue on that. Like to yep. coming up with a new idea of like, oh wait, I didn't combine it yet with this part I have in my bag. Yep. And uh, let's see how this fits together. That's, uh, yep. you're right. Yeah, we but can. Yeah. We can definitely figure out the details of that. The idea is super cool. Um, yeah, I, 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 I was thinking she's, she's feeling extremely insecure after the last infusion didn't work. So she's like, right, okay, I was gonna do a cool big thing. I'm gonna do a narrow thing first and get back to basics. Let's just let's start small. But that's what she's mostly focused on. Right on. Is there anything you want to do in these days, Sable? Um, Sable is quite relieved that they're letting her, letting them ride on the Triceratops thing, <laughs> uh, because several days of walking is not something that their body is particularly good at. Um, uh, and uh, if any of the merchants try to talk to them, they are entirely earnest. That intense look never fades. Like she, she, she's. They've got that aura of like. If they're if they're listening to you, they're looking at you. They are a hundred percent focused on li listening to you. <laughs> uh, like there is no distraction. It's just, oh, you're talking to me. I'm going to completely listen to you and focus on what you're saying now. Uh, which is how I'm how I'm arguing the high charisma is it's just they're intense and they listen like properly listen to anyone yes. talking to them and uh at, at a certain point uh they will sort of bring up do you think they were looking for another wellspring we don't know about in the swamp there that uh, has occurred to me yeah as since i reside around that area would i know anything about Will's, you know, since my character's purpose is protecting this type of stuff from people who would abuse it. Sable is asking the right questions and Leon would definitely have some input on that because uh, Leon, the two of you um, originating from the Hemlock Tangle, if I'm not mistaken, that yeah. forested area, you've been spending some time not just in the Hemlock Tangle, but also in the murk like swamps and surrounding areas. And any kind of wellspring would have stood out to you for two reasons. First of all, um, you never heard of a wellspring in the Merkli Swamp. And second of all, if there's something you learned about the people in this area so far, is that when someone finds a wellspring, it doesn't take long until a settlement starts forming around that wellspring. 
right. and especially on a tr um, um, on a trade route like the one that you're on, if there was an extra settlement somewhere in the swamp, that would be something that people would be very interested in. So if there was any kind of wellspring known, people would have already started to um, prepare it for a settlement. Okay. All right. Then uh, UN would just say, there is no wellspring in the swamp. If there is one, humans would have already flocked to it like flies on corpses. You which might well, have a point. Sorry. So which uh, wellspring do we think they're going after? Which is the nearest? I'm guessing like, so basically every city or settlement in this world will have a wellspring, right? Is that the mm -hmm. assumption we can make? Most of them, especially the ones that are basically like, that were established um, at a certain point when uh, the people of Thea started to spread out over the world, especially ones that were in the more dangerous regions, they needed wellsprings to have them be safe from monsters and other dangers. But in this area of the world, you can assume that most larger settlements um, will have uh, a wellspring to keep it safe. Well, perhaps they are talking about that city that is by the coast or up at the mountains. I do not know the name. I do not care for names because I forgot the player. <laughs> See, I, as the GM, would never forget the names of a world or something. I would never do that. There is no video proof of that, and no one can prove me otherwise. So, And uh, uh, Loarda uh, is listening intently to the conversation, and she chimes in, yet... Uh, consider this. Uh, my people has grown around in a place that was believed to be barren and uh, impossible to settle in, and yet we found ways. Uh, it is impossible to know everything that exists in such a small body, a small celestial body. Imagine, like, imagine a planet like this. I wonder, perhaps, if someone has found something no one else has found yet. What is the chance this could be deep inside the ground? If it has been found, we would know about it. Hmm. She just, like, looks away for a moment. She's not convinced, but they... But then again, she's an extra planetary uh, person, so, you know. But I will say that after asking that question, uh, Yuan and Yao will go into their typical, because their minds are ones, and so they are just communicating silently with each other, like, are we sure, are we sure, maybe we should double check, you know, that kind of, you know, just, just on some, they're like, it's basically, you know, when you are like debating things internally with yourself, that is what's happening between the two of them right now, and they are just distracted for the rest of the journey. <laughs> Just because I think it's fun, uh, what do the merchant people want to say or ask of any of us in particular? Just to give oh. the GM some some space oh, to have so some fun. I, I love that. That's a great idea. So I would say there's throughout these days, there are multiple questions that all of you get asked, but I want to just highlight like one question per character. Um, and Luara, somewhere in this journey, there is one of these traveling merchants, a, uh, a woman somewhere in her 20s, who uh, starts a conversation, strikes up a conversation with you. And she looks at you, she has like this one finger on her face, like she's really thinking. She's like, I think I heard you mention earlier that you're from one of the moons, right? Ah, indeed. And then... Uh... You know, and then this lady made an absolute mistake in raising this question because now Enluara is going to go over like the longest possible <laughs> that I had tried oh for this... whatever small question. But yes, this... what would it be? But, but, but in short, she says, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, yes. But in, in game, this woman uh -huh. is getting the 45 minute version of this. But yes. for us as players, we get the, yes, the answer is yes. Um, the answer is yes. 
<laughs> and um, after that explanation, she's like taking it all in and she's very patiently listening. She's like really actually really um, attent trying to stay attentive through all of your story. And then at the end, she's just like, I was actually also just wondering, um, just really curious because I've never been to one of the moons. What's um, what's your most favorite place about your home? You know, Anlo Ara was not expecting this type of question. She pauses for a moment and uh, she looks up, you know, to the sky. Uh, can we say that the moon is visible at this time? There's yeah. there's five moons in the sky. There's always a chance that one of them is visible. <laughs> okay, so, uh... but specifically Bloom. But it's specifically <laughs> Bloom. Um, she points up, you know, and she says, uh, "I. It is interesting that I never considered I'd be having this perspective. But see that little spot over there, darker one. Yeah. Yes. And then and Luarda goes into another diatribe. But uh, in short." Uh, she explains that within the area is like a a, a, a kind of uh, archaeology where they meant to replicate uh, forest. Like initially, it was meant to replicate the forest from like a home planet, but like due to several you know uh, uh, things such as gravity, you know, and other things like. The thing just became something else entirely. And uh, she says, and she explains, you know, she just tells a lot, like, all of the wonders of this place. Like, you know, how, because, like, the moon is totally locked, they have to, like, to uh, counter fates and die, night, night and day cycles, you know, and seasons and stuff. And uh, she explains that when the, uh, the artificial atmosphere changes you know for like seasonal and uh, daily uh, rotations um what happens is that it's absolutely like one of the most stunning things that you can ever like she has only had the privilege of going there like once or twice a season or something and by season it means like it's it's, it's uh, uh like sometimes the moon as the moon spins like as the you know we, we do have right. like seasons right uh, she can't go there often because of her obligations, and uh, uh, that don't act, that uh, that sound a lot like self-imposed obligations, you know. Right. Uh, but uh, bottom line is that whenever she has the chance to just stop for a moment and sit there, she pulls. You know, she's just like she feels like she's just in another world and that she's free. And she doesn't say that in those words, you know, because she's got this poised peak for any listener who's smart enough to pick up <laughs> a person who's extremely repressed would, uh, would hear that, you know. Beautiful. Beautiful. And the, the woman trader listens to that and takes it all in. She's really honestly smiling as she's warmed by Anne Luara's description of that beautiful place right glow you know like go bright and stuff she forgets she's where she is for a moment it's she's almost transported beautiful somewhere else looking. in these what <laughs> <laughs> sometimes else in these days there's there's another merchant that catches up with uh, the duo that is lian with uh, yao and yuan and at one point, no, having learned at this point that it is the fox that you need to go to to talk to, um, <laughs> one of these merchants catches up to you and ask and ask her. Now I remember. I've heard stories about the two of you. You, Hemlock Tangle, right? Two of you, the the boy and the fox. Yes. Um. Yeah. Some of the merchants they're telling themselves all these. All these stories about the two of you. Oh. Like some of you, some of them say that you're silent protectors of everyone who travels these roads. Others say that you're not too kind to us. Well, what, what, what's your deal? You see, like this wicked glint goes into Yuan's eyes as she sort of like smiles and just expose 
way too many teeth inside her extremely el elongated jaw and goes, well, I guess it depends on who's asking the questions. Are you mayhaps one of those that just travel through the forest and offer it the respect it deserves? Or do you defile it with your axes and fire? Uh, I just need to go through there to like for my work and also my nana lives in gullport so that's all i do uh, uh yuan drops a smile and goes like, then you have nothing to worry about oh <gasps> okay <laughs> and you're it's just the two of you you don't have any family or people you live with we have a we have companions and friends among the denizens of the wild in the tangles if that's what you mean i guess okay so you're not alone there in the forest oh no we are never alone in the wilds I smiles again Again, with too many teeth in that yes. smile. And the merchant asks is just like, okay. Well, I'm glad to know that some of the stories I heard about you two are not true, apparently. Because oh, they are true. But you oh. don't have to worry about those. Oh, oh, and there's this moment of realization <laughs> from this merchant. And he goes... I have to check the wares. I'll oh. talk to you later. And just wanders <laughs> off. And then Yuan chuckles to herself. And then Yao is just an uh, imperceptible head shake. <laughs> like they're the same people, but they <laughs> But even he's a bit like exasperated sometimes by the fox's antics. Right. At another point um, in this journey, uh, Vivi, um, the uh, there is the bearded merchant who has been catching, well, is catching up with you, having also noticed that of all these people in this entourage, you're the one who's most dressed for these travels and also well equipped with all this kind of technology you have with magic imbued in it. And at a certain point, the two of you are just walking alongside the caravan, and he goes. You walk like someone who has walked thousands of miles in those boots of yours. I I was very fortunate in that uh, my father was very good at uh, teaching me a uh, way of the wilds, as he used to joke about it. Though he never really liked referring to like gestures towards all of the vast landscapes and everything we passed by. He never really liked thinking of it that way. Sounds like a good thing to teach a child. There, our world has many beautiful but also dangerous places. He wanted to be sure that I never feared going outside, which uh, was a very funny thing, considering how much time he spent working on his own uh, tinkering and inventions at home when he wasn't out on the road. But did he succeed in not... Making you afraid outside? I I don't fear being outside. I don't even fear most of the creatures I encounter when I'm outside. I'm more afraid of people than anything else. He chuckles. Remember the first time I went on a long-distance caravan journey? I mean, that was many, many, many years ago. I mean, I have a bit of experience. Uh, <laughs> but... I remember the first time I had to take a caravan journey for months and weeks away from home. Like the moment I went out, my mind was filled with just these ideas of what kind of terrible monsters could haunt me, what kind of terrible situations in nature I could get in. Turns out whoever should have been afraid of was my business partner who embezzled all the funds on that, on that operation. And I lost me a lot of Zenit on that. So... 
Bound to agree. I think it's the people you sometimes need to be careful with. I think some of the most wonderful things have come out of what people's uh, ambitions coming to fruition have been. It's 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 interesting to figure out um, not only what you would like to accomplish uh, in the world, but who you'd like to be when you finally accomplish what you're setting out to do. And uh, it's it's a bit overwhelming at times trying to figure out what you'd like to take care of and all that. Sure is. But yet, here we are. And looking at the companions you keep, I think you're in very good company. I mean, an illustrious, interesting bunch, but good company nonetheless. You're, you're welcome to say that they're strange. Most people do seem to think of us all as strange when they meet us. You know what's strange? When ten years ago a moon blows up, that's strange. When <laughs> suddenly sa safe routes that you've been traveling for years are suddenly no longer safe because there's all kind of roaming creatures. When towns that you have been welcomed suddenly look at you suspiciously if they don't recognize you immediately as if you're some kind of danger to them. That is strange. I do not consider your companionship strange. Well, it's much appreciated. And I, I promise, and it, she she takes a little bit of time to reassure the merchant that in the event anyone had been a little skittish about the whole her pulling out the shadow crystal thing and working on stuff that uh, she's taken precautions to ensure that it, it will, any sort of harm that would occur from it would only affect her and is localized to her person, not anybody else. Right. So just so you know, we're going to take this caravan all the way up to Fork Bridge. Yeah, it takes a little bit more. Uh, not sure where we're heading from there, and I don't know what you and the rest of the of your party are planning to do. But um, if fate allows for it, and you're looking for something to do or some safe company to travel in, um, just come and look for uh, look for my uh, caravan here. Uh, name's uh, name's Yuri. It's a pleasure to meet you, Yuri. You are well. You are free to call me Genevieve. Genevieve. <laughs> I don't use it very often unless I trust somebody. So, and you seem delightful enough. But um, I think we'll we'll get back to you as a group once we separate, if need be. But I think, and she pulls out like a bag of things that she had gone off only for like twenty thirty minutes, and it secured enough materials not only for her to work with but for us to be fine sort of the nice flavoring for her well-resourced and resourceful right. ability that she has she's like i think we'll be okay and she's like aiming for the like how the hell did you do this response <laughs> so yuri is just looking at it at really surprised at how much vivi has there or genevieve has there uh available as this kind of conversation slowly wraps up, there is one final person that during these days of travel um, is also going to have a conversation with Yuri, and that is Sable. Um, somewhere along the journey, um, Sable, am I correct to assume that as much time as possible you spend up on furry Triceratops friend? Yes. And <laughs> uh, anytime they have to get off, they sort of fall ass over tea kettle onto the floor. They are not. They are not at all good at anything physical uh it's it's becomes very obvious to the merchants that they don't seem totally in control of their body like i said bambi sort of learning to walk it all looks very awkward but they're they're earnestly trying like they they, they don't seem embarrassed or anything they just they just treat it as if it's normal 
And it's at, at one of those moments where you fumble off, off of the furry triceratops and land on the ground that Yuri comes up and he looks down and he says, oh, well, be careful there, little one. Um, she's not going to trample you, but uh, you might break something one day if you keep doing this. Sable sort of gets up and, and dusts themselves off gently and puts that laser focus, intense expression towards uh, Yuri. I'm fine, thank you. You, uh, you have some interesting uh, traveling outfit there. Don't you, if you need something that might be better fitting, I could have some of us look into some of the clothing we have. Wouldn't mind sharing. Oh no, I, I like these. Thank you. Do they have a special meaning to you? They're the only thing I have that's mine. Oh. Oh, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. And they help with magical protection. Well, that sounds mighty useful considering what I saw you do a few days ago. Where, where did you learn that? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I don't know. I just, I just can do it. Hang on there. You say that you just one day found out that you can do that, that you can b blast something with magical dark energy. You just can do that. Uh-huh. And you're still giving him like the super intense look, right? Yeah, yeah. Their expression has not changed. They are 100% yeah. paying attention to like... <laughs> They are 100% invested in this conversation. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll humor you, assuming you just know how to do that. Um, wh what have you been doing with it since you knew how to do that? Um, helping Vivi when we run into monsters, mostly. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, seems that it's very useful against monsters. Yeah. So, you, so uh, Vivi, Genevieve, right? Uh-huh. You've been you've known her for a while did you do you know each other from like back in school are you childhood friends um traveling um, no. friends she, she found me when i woke up when you woke up uh-huh from a nap oh i don't know all right so genevieve found you when you woke up and you just knew how to do this magic uh-huh. And these clothes, which give you magical protection, are the only thing you have. Uh-huh. You notice that because you keep this super intense stare at him, he's like, at the moment, he feels a little bit awkward because he doesn't really know how to further respond in this she does not. Uh, they do not volunteer information besides exactly what, <laughs> what Yuri asks. <laughs> so they are not going to say anything unless he asks. <laughs> and Yuri, at one point, just like, as he's been thinking about the next question, he just... Sighs and says, do you want something to eat? <laughs> oh, yes, please. Vivi tells me food is important. Does she also tell you that food can be very, very delicious? Yes, I like tea. Tea? Ah, well, follow me. And uh, Yuri just takes the points into the direction to uh, one of the merchants who can make sure to pour you a very nice cup of tea. As uh, we also have the scene where basically we're at a point in the journey where the caravan is stopping for a bit, as everyone can take a bit of a tea break here. And we have all the party here together. Each of you are also getting something to drink, something to eat here as well. And we do see the camera slowly panning up a little bit upwards. So we can see over the hills ahead, just over a few more bends and curves, lies somewhere in a small valley a walled town and you can see even at this distance in the center of that town there's just this faint glow of something magical there some spire of coalesced hardened aura that keeps this place safe and we look at it we know it is the town of Forkbridge in the distance and like the bird we quickly fly towards that town 
We see it there, bustling the streets. There are other merchants, smoke rising out of chimneys. But we have the camera moving down into the street level and then into the sewers beneath it, deeper below. Not large sewer systems, but just a few. Footsteps echoing here. Coming around the bend in the sewers, we see a white dressed figure with long arms and a glassy thing underneath its hood reflecting dark purple light as we swipe to black on the first session of Sixth Moon Saga. Hey. Congratulations, everyone. You made it through the first session. Aha. How's everybody doing? Oh, so good. Loving that it so far. Oh, that's not so <laughs> Thanks, much. everybody. Ah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, I also boy. enjoyed it a lot. I'm really glad that all of you get a chance to also highlight your characters. We have a very fun set of characters here. Um, I was glad to also throw in, start it off with a little bit of combat to get you all a little bit in the flow of things and already a little bit of dice rolling action. And I'm really looking forward on how this continues already next week with this bunch of adventurers. So <laughs> before we... Uh, before we press escape, select save game and hope we still have enough space to save our game. Um, how about let's give everyone here at the table a chance to quickly tell us who they are, where we can find them. Um, and of course we can find them next week here again, but let's start out again. We're going around, I'm, let's, I'm going around the other direction this time, starting out with uh, Gabriel. Tell us who you are, where Ooh. can we find you? Okay, so again, my name is Gabriel. And I am from Brazil, by the way. I didn't mention that before. Um, I am a game designer and a professional GM. So if you want to look me up to uh, check the games that I make and, or, you know, get a, get a game going, you can find me as the gift of games everywhere on the internet. Uh, on, I am on Blue Sky. I am on that social media that shall not be named anymore. Uh, I, I'm not really there. I just I just do like uh, schedule the post there. Um, uh, Dice.camp on Mastodon. So you 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 can find me. I'm on Blue Sky. I'm on, on Threads. The Gift of Games. And uh, yeah, my thing is making games and facilitating games for people and playing games. Thank you very much, uh, Gabe. The Never Squid, aka Nev. Hi, everybody. I'm Nev, your friendly neighborhood Eldritch Squid person. I am an artist, a TTRPG performer, and moderator and producer. Uh, I am around a lot of TTRPG channels and a lot of charity projects. Uh, we just finished one a couple weeks ago, which was great. Uh, I will be here every week for the for the duration of this campaign. Uh, you can find me at the Never Squid on pretty much all the social medias, and uh, I, I have been playing Sable today, who is totally normal. I swear. Absolutely nothing to be worried about with Sable. Thank you for that, Nev. Moving on to Nikki. Hello there. I'm Nick, and I played our human fox duo, Lien, and uh, you can find me on. Basically, most social media as Nick Snack One with the number one, and of course, I will be here every week for this Fabula Ultima game with Horde of Tales. Not really, haven't been appearing or signing up for our APs lately because of work, <laughs> but who knows? Maybe soon. <laughs> All right, thank you for that, and thank you for being here. And then we move over to Angela. Hello there, lovely beans. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure having you all here tuning in for our first of many amazing sessions with a fantastic group. I am so excited to keep playing this game and enjoy this really delightful system that we're working with. In terms of places you can find me, uh, you can find me here on Horde of Tales very soon. 
on Mondays as I will be running a Thirsty Sword Lesbians game in the first ever world that I built in what is going to be, I think now at last count, the fourth or fifth era of my world's history in which I've had people roam around in it. Uh, I've worked on this thing for about six, five, six years now at this rate. And uh, yeah, I've never held to a project for that long before outside of learning how to play music. So uh, I have some executive function, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so happy and thank you so much everybody thank you and I'm Marcus uh, pronouncing him and you can find me online everywhere as Dutch individual I am mostly found here on Horde of Tales producing and running and sometimes even playing in games and especially in this game for the coming weeks um, regarding Horde of Tales uh, we will be back next week, Tuesday, same time, same place with this campaign, but definitely also check out all the other games that we have upcoming on our channel. If you want to have the easy ways to keep track of all of that, you can follow us on our socials. Links are down below. You can also join our Discord where we chat, hang out, and um, just have fun together as a community. And where you can also make sure that you're always pinged when we go live and whatever kind of games come up for us. So please join us there over as well. With all that being said, I want to say thank you to the table. I also want to say thank you to Behind the Scenes for our producer Caro for making sure that we all look good here and that all of this is being run. Hashtag thank your producers. And we are going to be back next week. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. And see you soon. Unheard of Tales. Bye. Mm -hmm.